the biggest thing is just having the debt pay down um, because that debt is being paid down all the time. Even if the cash flow isn't super, that debt is being paid down. Um, and then, of course, appreciation in America right now has just been crazy. Welcome to a special edition of Rock Your Money, Rock Your Life podcast. My name is Rock Thomas, and I am your whole life millionaire mentor. And I have the privilege of guiding people through a process and contributing toward their success of becoming whole life millionaires. Now, a whole life millionaire is somebody that doesn't give up their health and their relationships in order to become financially free, or at least on the first step toward building up the habits and behaviors to do just that. So today I have a special guest, one of our graduates, Michael Jones. He's a badass out of Austin, Texas, and we're going to learn about his story about what was life like before the journey began, where is he today, and what are some of the things he learned. So welcome to the podcast, Michael. Hey, Rock. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so this is one of my favorite sessions because, you know, they say that facts tell, but so stories sell. And your story is something that's going to lend proof to other people that, you know, can you move the needle? Can you go from where you were to where you maybe want to be? And what are some of the things that change? So let's talk about prior to the journey that you kind of dove into this personal development and worked with us in M1. Where were you? What were you doing? Um, and let's start there. Yeah, absolutely. So I've always been surrounded by personal development, although I can't say I appreciated it much as a kid. Um, you know, I thankfully I had a, a dad that was into Tony Robbins that uh, really believed in the power of the mind and set of goals. And, and so uh, to a certain extent, I had some of that guidance, but I hadn't embraced it myself. And so I was actually at a mortgage sales conference in 2014 when I saw Hal Elrod for the first time. And the Miracle Morning, his story, and, and picked up the book and, and started doing the Miracle Morning from there. And that's really when I would say my personal development journey started. So I would have been 26 at the time. And um, it, it really was just like that aha moment. You know, you can't ever go back to the way things were because now you've tasted, you know, what it looks like to, to really be intentional about your goals and, and have a way to achieve them. And, and I've always been very driven, but it was always just sort of this undefined passion I had. So um, that's when it got started. And um, from there, um, I was able to get into to tribes. Um, Diego Corzo introduced me to M1 and I got to know you and the rest of the group. And, and it's really just been, and, uh, it's been quite the journey since then. So when was that? Do you remember what year it was that uh, you started this journey with this, this mastermind group? Yeah. So I joined in, I think it was April of 2017. Yeah. So that was whenever I got into M1. Yep. Okay. And did you own real estate then? I know you're, you're, you're selling mortgages, but did you own much real estate back then? I did not. So uh, mostly uh, I, I was somebody that didn't really like debt. And so I was debt free for the most part. And, and um, but I, I, I knew the power of investing. I knew the power of real estate, but I just was always afraid to take that jump. And so I bought my very first real estate investment property, a single family in, uh, in a tertiary market to Austin in March of 2018. So that, and then that was just kind of the start from there. Okay. And so what do you own now? So I own six doors uh, in that market. So I own four single family residentials. I own a duplex. And then I actually, in December of 2020, sold a 10,000 square foot medical facility that I designed, built, um, leased, and then ultimately sold. And so I've got 1.245 million sitting in escrow right now under contract for 34 acres of raw land that's zoned industrial. So that one's a little bit harder to quantify because uh, it's not door it's not square feet it's just acreage at this point um, but I'm I'm on track to close on that in June and then start building on it so and what will that project project look like what can you make on that you turn that uh, that little over a million dollars what do you hope to turn and in what period of time 
So I think I'm looking at about a 36 month horizon uh, from the moment I can really turn the dirt till I'm, I'm either out of it or I'm fully leased. And so there's two separate parcels. There's a 23 acre parcel, uh, which I'm going to put a couple of medical, maybe office uh, buildings on. So that's going to be about four acres of it. And the rest of the 19 acres is going to be all industrial and um, looking to, to really make that kind of plumbers, electricians, and anybody that needs to move up. So the biggest building that I'm going to build there is about 30,000 square feet of just kind of shell industrial space warehousing. Um, and the cool thing about it is it's located right next to the airport and it's located next to two uh, major highways in Texas, I-35 and then the 130 toll that goes through and around Austin. Um, so I'm really excited about that. So that's 23 acres and then 11 acres is very similar to it. So all in, I think I'm going to be able to put like 350,000 square feet of building. So I went from 10,000 square feet of medical on one acre acre to 350,000 on about 34 acres. So it is going to be a big project for sure. So where do you get the confidence to do something like that? You're, you're not a developer per se, right? Yeah, uh, failing. Um, so uh, I actually, I was involved in a residential construction company, a custom home construction company for a few years and just learned some of the ins and outs. Um, and that was homes and I'm dealing with commercial, but a lot of it's the same, right? So we're all pouring a foundation and there's plumbing and electrical and you know, you've know you got a roof and all that. So while it's different, a lot of the basics are the same. And so I learned what it meant to make sure I had a good contract and budgeting and, and taking things out to bid and not to go crazy with change orders for buildings that'll drive up the cost and you don't get the ROI on it. So um, ultimately, I had to shut that company down at the end of 2018 after about four years of just not being profitable and just headache after headache. So I learned a lot from that, but it gave me the confidence to approach raw land and say, I I've put homes on raw land and you know had to kind of speculate on demand. So that gave me the confidence, but it was through failing for sure. So when you when you started this journey in 2017, what was approximately your net worth, would you say? I, I think, and you know, this is going back a few years, and I've been trying to track it a little bit, but I was probably sitting at about 250,000 or so in net worth. And where would you say you are approximately today? So I actually filled it out at the end of March. And so I am sitting at 2.5 million in net worth. A large part of that is bundled up in that land that I'm getting ready to develop, but basically 10 X. Yeah. So for those of you that are listening, we have a document called a life plan that tracks. It's like a dashboard and we get people to track everything. And we believe that you can't improve what you don't measure. And tracking is so important because when it's in front of you, your attention goes to it and you can tweak it and you can add to it and you can delete things that aren't working. So has that been a good tool for you working with that one sheet slash life plan? Yeah, it has been. Um, I've always struggled with it's kind of setting long-term bucket list, you know, type goals. And so it's really helped me to think down the road a ways and be intentional about those, those bucket list adventures, those things that really allow me to sit back and say, man, that was a great life um, because I enjoy working. I enjoy working hard. And so it's easy for me to get caught up in the grind of just kind of working and, and slugging it out versus really stepping back and saying, you know, what do I want my life to be? And, and it's not all about work. Um, and I really like the division of the gardens because for folks that are trying uh, to make the most out of their wealth and earn and, and accumulate, it's very easy to let your health go by the wayside or to, to really destroy all the relationships around you. And so having those eight gardens that we're intentional about really keeps us on track. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, what have you done with your health? And you mentioned before that you kind of started with your morning routines, but what have you done specifically with your health? And then we can transition maybe a bit to your relationships. And Tony Robbins does this thing where he draws these circles on work, relationships, and self. And often people come to this epiphany, right? Where they look at it and they go, oh my God, I spend 85% of my time at work and 10% with my family and I have nothing left for myself. And then they're overweight, diabetic and, and struggling, or, you know, they're running triathlons and they're working really hard, but they always have the excuse they're never home. So how did those three circles kind of, what awareness was brought to those three circles for you and how did that play out? 
Yeah. So for health, um, you know, I'd always been, I, I'll call myself, you know, naturally athletic, but not, not a superstar by any means, you know, just able to, to get involved in any sport and do fairly well at it. Uh, but as I got into my mid twenties and I was working, uh, I was just, I was staying up too late. I wasn't eating right. And so being more intentional about waking up at 5 AM and, and focusing on health, um, I started running, um, I started lifting. And so I would say I was probably at my peak fitness in 2019 before our friend COVID showed up. And uh, I allowed that to derail me. It didn't need to, but I did allow it to. And so in 2021, I've really gotten back on the health wagon. Um, next Sat Sunday, I'll be running a half marathon in Austin. So I've been training for that. I've been hitting the Peloton and just being very intentional about it. And then through that health garden, I've also signed up for a half triathlon in September in Texas. So I've never done anything like that. I'm excited for the challenge. Uh, so that's health. And then relationships, um, you know, that's something that definitely I, I didn't pay enough attention to prior to this process, um, being willing to be authentic and transparent in relationships versus wearing the mask that I thought people you know, expected of me or, or trying to, you know, uh, protect myself. And so um, reading books and, and really having good discussions about just showing up and being authentic and if people like it great. If they don't, that's them, but you know, at least it's me being me and, and not trying to hide. Um, and so that's shown up in my marriage, um, you know, being more authentic with my wife and, and trying to go deeper and then being a dad. So I've got two kids and um, really just being hyper intentional about the time I spend with them and and the lessons I try to share with them and making sure that I don't try to provide a lifestyle that, you know, ultimately they enjoy in the moment, but they look back on and say, I never knew my dad. And so I want to make sure that I don't repeat that sin. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Yep. Congratulations. So we talk a lot about creating um, horizontal income, which is passive income. Most people would know um, multiple streams of income. Uh, how has that played out for you? you? You still have your mortgage company. You still work in that. A lot of people would say, man, you get this great development. Why don't you just pour yourself full time into that? Why don't you just make that your thing? What decisions have you made vis-a-vis -vis that to you know, maintain multiple streams of income so that um, your wealth continues to grow and you don't have all your eggs in one basket? Yeah, great question. So that was a newer concept for me um, because I I kind of grew up with the traditional belief of just put your money in the stock market and just you know continue to save diligently. And through this process, I just realized, hey, I didn't want to spend 50 years working to get 10 years of, of life, you know, and, and hopefully, you know, we don't have any more 08 crises or any other things that wipe out wealth along the way. Um, and so that's part of the reason why I got into real estate is being able to get the monthly cash flow off of those, as well as the tax benefits of depreciation and interest deduction. And then maybe the biggest thing is just having the debt pay down. Um, because that debt is being paid down all the time. Even if the cash flow isn't super, that debt is being paid down. Um, and then, of course, appreciation in America right now has just been crazy. So for me, it hasn't been as much of how can I maximize my uh, – the amount of my horizontal income, I've tried to focus on how many streams can I put together um, and then have that long-term debt pay down and, and some appreciation along the way. Um, so that's uh, – uh, part of the reason why I switched into commercial is because I could go from a stream into maybe a river um, because with commercial, you got bigger dollars and you've got stronger tenants a lot of times, uh, notwithstanding COVID. <laughs> and uh, you're, able to, uh, you're able to get that horizontal income up much higher for maybe not a whole lot more effort. So that, that's why I switched to commercial. Yeah, nice. How many streams of income would you say you have right now? I have... I have eight. So six of those would be from my single family doors. Uh, a seventh would be from my commercial activities. And then I wrote a book. Uh, this would be the eighth one. I wrote a book back in 2016, I think it was, maybe 2017. And that income is is very small, but it is income nonetheless. And it's always fun to just kind of see like, oh, hey, you know, I sold a book overnight. And um, so I, I would say about eight. Yeah, I can relate to that last one as well. So uh, let me check out what you think of this metaphor. I think that, <clears throat> like you said, we were, we were raised to get a good education, get a job and work for 40, 50 years and, and then retire and get 10, 20 years of life. And it's kind of like you're one player on the basketball court against five. 
food, transportation, housing, uh, all of your miscellaneous, you know, apps and things like that. And then whatever you choose, you want to buy a motorcycle, a boat or what have you. So you kind of like five major categories that, that are constantly coming at you and scoring against you called debt. And then you get out there on the field with your one job and you're trying to fend off these five other players. And I always thought that this journey of the whole life millionaire was how quickly can you recruit and add another player? buy your first single family home, or maybe write a book. And now you've got your book in a single family home. You got three players on the field. You got a little couple of people to pass to. You're not working all the time. Now you're up to eight players against five players. What kind of momentum do you have? What kind of confidence do you have? You could have one or two of your players sitting on the bench during COVID a little bit tired, not doing so well, but still not fall behind. What do you think of that as a metaphor? Yeah, I think it's great, um, you know, because it, the, the amount that we rely on just that W-2, uh, we think that gives us a lot of security. And yet we if, if we don't own that company, a uh, boss could come to us one day and just say, hey, you know, I'm taking your, your best player out and, uh, you know, you don't get to play basketball any longer. And all of a sudden you're totally flat footed. You don't have any sort of a safety net. And so um, I think folks really just realizing how little control they have working a nine to five and a salary, it's predictable potentially, but it's not controllable. And that's ultimately what'll, what'll shipwreck people is they just get crashed along the rocks and then they're, they're stuck, you know?